extremely pleased to be able to present this. Uh, you can see the cover of my book here, and I will uh, proceed with going ahead. Book cover, which uh, was created by Mary Ross Design, who's based here in Flagstaff. First time I saw it, just totally captivated me. I was uh, so surprised because of the division that she did between a, an historical photograph on the left side, uh, 1892, and it's paired with my repeat on the right side. And I especially like the fact that she included the horse and the carriage in the uh, photograph, the historical photograph from 1892. And I don't remember now how long it took me, hours at least, and it maybe wasn't even until the next day before I noticed the outline around it was the drawing. And that drawing uh, is uh, from an 18, is an 1858 drawing. And it uh, really blends in well with the uh, cover of the book and also shows uh, the San Francisco peaks in the upper left corner there. But this project was a seven year, seven plus year adventure for me. First of all, finding and acquiring historical photographs, obviously repeating each of these photographs as precisely as possible. Writing and publishing this book, which has 117 pairs of historical and repeat, repeat photos. I actually did about 125 or so, but uh, some of them were similar and I decided not to include those that were very similar. So the sources in terms of uh, where I obtained the photographs, 22 of them. And my, there we go. Uh, so you can see some of them here and the rest of them here. So roughly half of them are from Arizona, we're, are based in Arizona. The other half extended across the United States from California to the uh, East Coast. Now a key goal of repeat photography is to match each historical photograph's photo point and frame. Photo point means the precise spot where the uh, historical photographer took the picture. Frame, of course, means what's included in the photograph and excluded from the photograph. And what I uh, was able to use here were landforms and distinctive rocks that were in the historical photograph that helped me find the photo point and also to frame the photograph. Another very important thing to match is the time of the year. You know, if you take a photograph uh, that uh, was a historical photograph that was done in the middle of summer and you repeat it in the winter, that's like night and day. So, of course, you don't want to be doing that. Now, unfortunately, this time of year is rarely in the records, historical records. So what I used were the presence and the absence of snow and leaves on deciduous trees, such as quaking aspen. Also very important is the time of day. This is never recorded in the records, uh, all those that I saw. And so what I uh, had to use here were shadows. And this may not sound like much to you, but it's extremely important to uh, take the photograph at the same time of day so that the shadows are not different. The shadows are, are the same. There's no confusion. Now, to facilitate future repeats, it was also, which is also very important to me, I, uh, I wanted to record, I did record, rather, the GPS coordinates of each photo point. In addition to that, because GPS coordinates are a are little, little vague, I mean, you don't get a precise spot with uh, GPS. So in addition to that, I marked the photo point with a small pile of rocks, but only in locations that were unobtrusive. So not in downtown Flagstaff, not in someone's yard. I avoided those. But whenever I could, I put a small pile of rocks there. In addition, I photographed my tripod positioned on the photo point, stood back away from it, and took that photograph to show it. Furthermore, I photographed wide angle views directly at the photograph, zero degrees, 90 degrees to the right, 180 degrees straight back, and 270 degrees to the left. Furthermore, uh, to facilitate future repeats, I will be redepositing all of my photographs, GPS coordinates, and so forth in special collections and archives of Klein Library at Northern Arizona University. My hope is that if some, when someone does repeat it, it's not uh, if, it's when, if it's say 50 years, something like that, uh, they will have enough information that will, will take them two years to do it at most and not uh, the seven to eight years that it took me. As an ecologist, so one of the things that was very important to me was to uh, include photographs from each of the major ecosystems around the San Francisco peaks. 
So in the foreground, of course, we have pinyon juniper woodland and grassland. And the above that, of course, is ponderosa pine. Mid elevations have mixed conifer and quaking aspen forests. Higher elevations with spruce fir forests. And then at the top of some of the peaks, alpine tundra. As far as background about wildfires, there are in general terms, three different kinds of wildfires. Some are called surface fires. Others are called crown fires and others are called mixed severity fires. Now surface fires, as the name says, burns along the ground and these are typically burning at low intensities. Crown fires burn from tree crown to tree crown and these are typically at very high intensities. Mixed severity fires burn with intermixed patches of surface fire and ground fire, hence the term mixed severity. Now the largest wildfire in the region by decade, this is really interesting, I think. So the, the data may look a little boring, but uh, I think it's ex exceedingly interesting. So let's look from the 1900s to the, through the 1980s. So in the 1900s, the largest wildfire in those 10 years was 6,345 acres. And you see some years it went down, other years it went up a little bit. 1980s, 2,709. So there's no clear trend there from the uh, turn of the century, early uh, the 19th century, the 20th century, excuse me, uh, through the 1980s. But get ready for this. 1990s, largest single fire in the, that decade was 17,000 acres. 2000, 15,700 acres, 2010s, 21,700 acres. And then this decade, and of course, we're only four years into the decade, is 26,532 acres. That was the tunnel fire from last summer. So the clear trend is dramatic change over the last uh, three, four decades with much larger fires and much more intense fires. Now, what has led to this? Why have they increased in size as well as in intensity? Livestock grazing, one factor is that livestock grazing became common in the late 19th century. And that removed fuels from the uh, floor, floor of the, uh, from the soil surface. And then another factor was fire suppression became widespread in the mid 20th century. So that stopped, basically stopped fires. Both of these initially reduced the spread of wildfires, initially. However, decades without fire greatly increased the live and the dead fuels for fires, such as live trees and dead limbs and needles. Consequently, with more fuels and increased continuity of fuels, fires now burn more intensively and often spread over larger areas. And that's, why, that's why we have what we have today. Now, I'm going to be presenting uh, my repeat uh, photos, some of them, of course, only about a dozen or so. And uh, what these, how these will be presented is the first thing you'll see is a historical uh, image, and obviously in black and white. That will slowly fade, and I probably won't be speaking, slowly fade into my black and white repeat. So black and white and black and white. But I also took color repeats, and that black and white repeat will fade into my color repeat. So if you're ready to travel through time, here we go beginning with the first photograph of the San Francisco Peaks, which dates to 1867. There's my black and white repeat. And there's my color repeat. So here we have the black and white repeat on the left, obviously, and the color repeat on the right. Uh, this is east of the San Francisco Peaks, so uh, it's on private land, and uh, fortunately, uh, the people, without any question, let me on their property to repeat the photograph once I determined that was probably where it was taken from. Um, and let's see, some descriptions for the uh, historical photograph. You see two soldiers on horseback there. So this photograph was taken on a survey, during a survey, from uh, for a railroad to connect the central United States to California. And that's what they were looking for and traveled throughout this, uh, this uh, northern part of Northern Arizona. Alexander Gardner was a professional photographer and he uh, was actually a very extensive photographer of the Civil War. So uh, he was the one who took the picture. And if you look towards the lower right-hand corner, 
you can see the shadow of him on the right and his camera on the left. Unfortunately, I did not repeat that, but over on the right side, you can see my color uh, repeat of the uh, photograph. So the foreground has not greatly changed. It's been grazed a lot. So there are fewer grasses, more dirt exposed there. And of course, in the midground, you can see people's homes and other buildings. But if you look into the uh, more interesting part, at least interesting to me, would be what's uh, showing on the San Francisco peaks and the Dry Lake Hills. And at first glance, what appears to be the case is that there's a lot more snow today than what there was in December 1867. However, that is not the case. So you always have to interpret your repeats to uh, make sure you're, you understand them correctly. What has gone on to make it look more white, more snow apparent in the right-hand photograph is that the, um, the slopes, the east facing slopes of the San Francisco peaks and the Dry Lake Hills have been burned off in crown fires. So with all the trees removed, or at least most of the trees, nearly all the trees removed, uh, when snow falls, it's much more apparent than what it had been in December 19, 1867 when the trees were there and blocked the view of the, of the snow. So you have to be careful in interpreting the photographs to make sure it makes sense and is more is realistic. Downtown Flagstaff. Fading into the black and white repeat. Fading into my color repeat. So here we have a chance to compare these two. Uh, the one on the left, the oldest, uh, the uh, first building in this part of Flagstaff, what was called Newtown Flagstaff, known as Newtown Flagstaff, is a, um, a general store. And that was built, if I remember correctly, 1883. And um, several intriguing things about the photograph. First of all, from a societal standpoint, notice all the people on the uh, porches of the two buildings. And uh, it took me a while to explain this to myself. And then I realized, oh, photographs were uncommon back then. Once the people knew that photographs were going to be taken downtown, they collected there and stood there so they would be in the photograph. You notice the people aren't moving, you know, they're not blurred. So they're just sitting there waiting for the photograph, photographer rather, to be finished. But ecologically, the more important thing is Flagstaff, unknown to most people, did not begin in a ponderosa pine forest. Downtown Flagstaff, as you can see here, began in what was mostly a grassland, but with scattered large ponderosa pine trees. Now you may say, well, some of these trees were cut and uh, used for lumber for the buildings and so forth. Well, I blew up the photographs so I could see the stumps and there were very few stumps back there, far fewer than what the uh, wood for the buildings would have required. So, and other photographs that I have also show that Flagstaff began in a um, savanna, primarily grassland with just scattered trees. Now, it took me a while to figure this out, but clearly the historical photograph was taken from an, uh, an elevated position. And then I realized that the oldest building, the oldest structure, we word it that way, the oldest structure in downtown Flagstaff was not that building, but was a uh, water tower for the railroad. And so this photographer climbed up the uh, water tower and took the photograph. Obviously that water tower has been gone for decades, but I finally got the nerve to request the fire department to ask for assistance from the fire department. And much to my extreme pleasure, they agreed to do that. So they uh, put me up in the air on a, on a ladder, on a truck, uh, raised it up in the air, and I was able to repeat the, uh, the photograph about as precisely as one can do these days. By the way, uh, this is uh, Route 66 in the foreground in North San Francisco Street going away from us there. The building on the right corner, which is on the corner where the historical building was, looks somewhat alike. Uh, however, these buildings in downtown Flagstaff, most of them have burned down three or so times. And so that's not the same building. A little bit north of downtown. Port Valley Road and US 180. So in the uh, current photograph, the uh, repeat is showing the secret school on the left. 
I uh, call this a viewpoint repeat because I was unable to stand on the photo point and take a photograph. If you look to the right in the viewpoint repeat, you can see a fence on the other side of the fence are lots of trees and, and many homes. It's a subdivision. So it was impossible for me to walk back there and get a photograph showing the forest on the far side of, uh, of uh, 180. So I took it here. And because it's not a photo point, I call it a viewpoint. Something really intriguing here is you can notice the density of the forest on the hill in the background. It's much more dense today than what it was when the historical photograph was taken in 1898. This of course reflects fire suppression, the absence of fires that used to burn through Ponderosa pine forests frequently. And the unusual thing about this is only a year or two before I took the, my repeat photograph, that forest back there had been thinned. So even though it's been thinned, it's still far less dense, uh, far more dense, excuse me, far more dense than what it had been when the historical photograph was taken. Keep your eye on this rock right here with the sun on it and the shade on it. So this is in the drainage next to the Museum of Northern Arizona. So those of you who have been there, which I would assume almost everybody in this uh, audience would have been there. Uh, when you walk out towards the main door, uh, you go past the flagpole. And maybe 20 feet away from that flagpole is where this photograph was taken in 1887. So unlike some of the photographs, which took me days to uh, relocate and do, redo precisely, it took me about 20 minutes to find this, uh, this photo point thanks to uh, the drainage and that uh, rock. That rock is on, obviously still there. Now, notice the increase of ponderosa pines. No big surprise in the suppression of wildfires and with grazing, uh, ponderosa pines have invaded and become much, much more widespread, much more dense. And so the photograph on the right is pretty much what I would have expected. One of the surprising things though is that this historical photograph actually has the date, the specific day of the year. Some of the photographs I dealt with only gave like a decade. Other photographs gave only the year. A few of them gave the month and year, and only a handful, I don't know for sure, five maybe, something like that, gave the month, the day, and the year. Well, by having that, what this meant I could do would be to return on June 3rd, about two or three years ago, I went out there and redid, retook the photograph. So I got out there before dawn and I was waiting for the sun to come up. I had my camera and tripod all ready to go and so forth, waiting for the sun to come up and uh, not expecting the sunlight to hit that rock because of all the, all the you know, increased density of the forest. So I uh, was very pleasantly surprised when it started, to, the sunlight started to hit the top of that rock. And as it did so, I started taking a pho photographs every quickly, just bang, 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 bang. And that enabled me then to look at the photographs afterwards and pick out the one that most precisely matched the sun and the shade on that rock. So I will brag a bit by showing you this. My photograph was taken 131 years later, plus or minus 30 seconds. Believe me, that's, that's pretty, pretty unusual and uh, odd. <laughs> Then east of town, we can start here in the in the mix. Uh, sorry, start here in the pinyon juniper woodland. Off on the left side is the uh, road many of you are probably familiar with. There's Loop Road, but Loop Road actually appears in the 1889 photograph, which surprised me. And you can even see how uh, Loop Road was, uh, this curve was cut off here and reduced, but this the curve, the lack of trees on that curve still shows up. But ecologically, the main thing is very few pinyon juniper trees down here in 1891. And now most of that landscape is covered with pinyon juniper woodland. The only areas where it's not covered are in the foreground are where there are, are, are houses, uh, where there are power lines and so forth. And uh, so it's a dramatic change, enormous change versus what it had been uh, before people came, uh, before 
uh, fire suppression began in this region. Probably even more important in this case was livestock grazing before that became widespread. Still in opinion, juniper woodland, but by Red Mountain. So if you're unfamiliar with Red Mountain, it is the open volcano that you can see on the way to the South Rim along Highway 180. And um, one of the nice things about this is, although it turned out to be a, a challenge, that is you notice the rock here is the same as the rock there. And this is a good example of getting the shadows to match. Several other things to see in the photograph. Here's a cowboy over here and some of the livestock he was responsible for here. Now the pinyon juniper woodland had some open spaces and closed spaces. The closed spaces were next to a drainage. The open spaces were were because they had burned maybe 30 years before this photograph was taken. Since then, there have been no fires here, uh, right in this specific location, a little bit further beyond it. Uh, there have been fires, but not right here. And you can see the increase of density of the Pena Juniper Woodland is enormous. Now you can also see that there's increased density of ponderosa pine forest on Slate Mountain. And we'll talk more about the peaks when we have photographs that show them up closer. Port Valley. Quite a change. So at higher elevation than Pinyon Juniper Woodland, of course, is Ponderosa Pine Forest. And here we see the same site, uh, 140 so years apart. And um, obviously a dramatic increase of the uh, Ponderosa Pines. Now, this is on a quite steep slope. And so some of the rocks that are in the foreground in the historical photograph, if I can, there we go, uh, have slid down slope and so forth. Uh, but some of them are still the same. So just to prove it, it is the same site. Notice the uh, one by the legs of that uh, gentleman. And I've circled the same rock over on the right side in the color photograph. Furthermore, whoops, furthermore, this large rock here is the same, of course, as the large rock in the center of the photograph uh, on the right. So dramatic increase in Ponderosa pine forests related to two things. One, livestock grazing, which removes the herbaceous layer, allowing seeds to grow, tree seeds to grow better. And of course, the lack of forest fires. So fires burn through the Ponderosa pine forest historically once every 10, 12 years, something like that. And this has probably been unburned for probably since the historical photograph was taken. But when you enlarge the historical photograph, as with several of the other ones that I'll mention to you, there are oftentimes interesting things that appear in them. In this case, there's Fort Moroni. You can see a building there. It's you know, very small because the distance is large. It's about a mile. Uh, but you can still see the dark band going across from left to right. And that is Fort Moroni. Fort Moroni is why this valley is known as Fort Valley. Fort Moroni was established in 1881 by, the, by Mormons. And the Mormons uh, moved here because they had a contract with the railroad to produce ties, uh, cut trees and make ties for the railroad. And they had concerns about uh, living here. And so they built this fort. They never had a use for it, but uh, never had a need for it. But uh, that is, is Fort Moroni. Of course, it is, it is long gone. And here's the north end of Fort Valley. Including two uh, views of Fort Valley because they show in part the same thing, but then we have the San Francisco peaks in the background to, uh, to enlarge upon. So if you, uh, this is again 1883 by the same photographer that took the previous one. And that is his son in the photograph and his dog next to him. But uh, you notice that slope in Ponderosa Pine Forest 
is covered with trees today, except for one small, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me go back on that. That's weird. Here we go. Um, so you see that uh, that slope is now covered with trees. Now, I would agree with you, there are a few stumps on this slope. When I enlarged it, I could see a few of them. And they, some of them may have been cut for this building here and maybe for the logs carrying the uh, water from the spring. However, uh, if you look at the slope above here, that's a fairly open slope too. And I have hiked up there off trail. And trust me, that is very steep and very, very challenging. Nobody in the 1880s went up there to cut trees. And yet you can see over here on the right that that forest is much greatly increased in density. And again, it's because of livestock grazing and the lack of, uh, of fires. But here we can also look up on the San Francisco peaks. And one of the interesting things is, you notice this spot right here is this spot right, whoops, this spot right here, excuse me. And so that had burned in a severe crown fire sometime before 1883, and the trees have not completely in, invaded that site. But elsewhere, where there had not been severe fires, you can see the forest here is much, much more dense than the forest was in the past. And that would be, of course, due to the lack of, uh, lack of fires, the suppression of wildfires. You can also, in part, see that some of the um, spruce fir forest is much less dense there than what it is here with a longer time since the last previous fire. Hart Prairie, northern end of Hart Prairie. Now we have three photographs here instead of just two. Uh, the historical photograph, obviously, on the left, and uh, before the site was thinned, and then during the time that the site was thinned. So this is a very famous photograph for people who live in Hart Prairie, and even those like myself, I had seen this photograph many times before. And it's so eye-catching with the San Francisco peaks in the background, and uh, Hart Prairie in the mid and the, uh, a little bit in the background as well. So uh, I wanted to repeat this, and uh, when I... Uh, was talking with some of the people that lived out there. Nobody knew, even though they had the photograph on their wall, exactly where the photograph had been taken. Well, I had a friend or two that lived out there, and so I talked with them, and they said, well, we don't know, but we think maybe about a mile away from Hart Prairie, and the trees have come in, and that's why, you know, just you can't find it today. So one morning, I got up, and I got out there around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, something like that, and I just started a mile away, and I walked towards the peaks. And it just had to zigzag back and forth. You know, I'd see rocks 200 feet to my right. So I'd have to walk over, over there to see if they matched these rocks. 200 feet to the left, 300 feet in some places, checked out those rocks. So I was going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then I got very close to Hart Prairie. And here we are. So if you look at these rocks here, they are the same ones as you see here. These rocks don't show up because they're in the shadows here. So I told my friends, and uh, one of them worked for the, uh, the Nature Conservancy that has a Hart Prairie Preserve there. And he called the Forest Service to let them know that we had, or I had, uh, relocated the photo point for this famous, famous photograph. So we all agreed to meet out there, the uh, uh, Nature Conservancy people and the Forest Service people and myself. So I bring them to the site. It obviously wasn't thinned at that time, brought them here. And the Forest Service said, no, this, this doesn't fit. This is not the site. And I, I looked at them and said, really? Look at this rock. Look at the uh, shadow and the crack in that rock. Same with over here. Look at this rock back here. It has this shelf-like thing over there. And this rock does too. And of course, this rock they could then see because we were there in the, in the morning. And they saw that was a match too. So they finally agreed, yes, I had found the, uh, the photo point for this, uh, this photograph. So what they wanted to do was to restore the view, which made good sense to me. I think they would have got carried away a little bit with that, but we can see what it looks like during the thinning, which is really a very good match with the historical photograph. So there's, there are more things to see here because almost any time you enlarge some of the historical photographs, you spot things that you have just briefly noticed before, 
You may see a couple little white spots there next to the trees. So here they are compared with a uh, photograph that was after the thinning. So again, I'm talking about these little white spots over here. And you can see them there. And there are also something else that shows up. It doesn't show up too well unless you really enlarge the photograph on the left of those white spots. What the white spots are are tents. And to the left are wagons. And so it was apparent that there was a group that camped here at that time. And I would be willing to bet that the photographer was part, part of that group. Photograph dates back to 1885. So this is a, this is a while back. I had already noticed something else, but then I realized what it was. This line that goes across the photograph there, the dark line that goes across there, what that is, is the uh, route of the wagon, wagons that traversed uh, Hart Prairie at that time. And then I got, I suppose, a little carried away, but I couldn't resist. I blew up this tree and looked at these marks on the tree, thinking they were just places where branches had broken off. But the one that I circled there is not, a from a branch that had broken. Those were initials that had been carved in that tree probably 10 years before the photograph because those initials, the bark of there is healed and it's black when it first heals. And so uh, this is probably not the first uh, photograph that was taken from this exact spot. But there's uh, ecological things also, of course, to talk about here. Notice the uh, grassland in the middle of the photograph there. And in the middle distance here, you don't see any grassland at all. Part of the reason for that is that the tree density in the, in the mid ground there has increased a lot and the trees have gotten, some of them have gotten taller. And so it sort of blocked the view. But when you walk back there, you can see some grassland, but nothing remotely like what it was back at this time in 1885. Then look at this grassland over on the right side of the photograph. Compare that with the grassland is there, that is there today. And this also needs to be explained because prior to maybe 10 years before the photograph taken, there was no grassland at all on the right side. It was completely in, uh, in, invaded by trees and was converting into forest. Since then, some of those trees, uh, sections of those trees have been removed and uh, restoring the, uh, the grassland that used to be there. Still, of course, far smaller than what had been there before in 1885. And then only maybe about a quarter of a mile further north from that, that photo point. Quite a change, hmm? So spring of 19, 1900, and the photographer, Fred Plank Platworthy, took a trip to the South Rim at that time on the uh, wagon road, uh, one part of the wagon road that went to the uh, South Rim. That's his, his wagon in the near center, near the center, rather, of the photograph. So I, I recognize immediately this area had dramatically increased in tree density. So this is a mixed conifer forest, and those have indeed become much, much more dense than what they have been before. So I really, really wanted to find the, uh, the photo point. The only possibility that really existed to me was that rock there and the other rocks that are close to it. But that rock there has a little lobe on the left side. It may be too small for you to see, but it's right at the tip of that, that arrow. So I thought, well, if I find these rocks, then I can sort of line things up and repeat the photograph. So Again, I got out there at this location about nine o'clock in the morning, something like that, driving out there and walked back and forth, back and forth. This is not a long distance, but uh, again and again and again. And then lunchtime came and I was getting frustrated because I couldn't find the rocks. And so I um, stopped, so, um, took off my backpack, put the backpack on the ground. And guess what? It was right next to that rock with that load. So sometimes you need blind luck to give you uh, help in finding these, these locations. Now, you don't see that rock on the right-hand side because it's blocked by aspens. This particular aspen right here blocks that rock. But just to show you, it's the same spot. See that rock in the uh, repeat photograph? That is this rock in the, in the historical photograph. So there's no question in my mind that this is the same spot. 
But something else that was really interesting to me in the photograph that showed something ecological are the bases of all those aspens. Notice how they are all black, how they are all uh, reflecting past ground fires, surface fires that have moved through there. Now with surface fires, because this was actually a little bit of a grassland here, small, narrow, fairly long, but narrow. And uh, so fires would burn through probably every uh, five years, seven years, something like that. And which are the basis of the trees, the trees, the, the regrowth of the base of the tree would be black. And so you can see that in those photo in that photograph. If you look at the aspens in the repeat photograph on the right, none of them have that blackened base. And that's because the fires have stopped. And that's also the explanation for the increase of trees throughout this, this location. Little Spring. The uh, photograph on the left shows a soldier, a sergeant, as a matter of fact, uh, leaving his group to uh, go back to his base. And uh, that was taken in June 1887. And you can compare that with a photograph on the right. And uh, if you've been to Little Spring, you know that it's a, it's a reasonably significant water source. And so ranchers in the early days, especially, um, grazed intensively around there. They brought their livestock out there and uh, grazed the uh, landscape intensively. And I'll swear, when I look at that photograph, I cannot see the historical one. I cannot see a single blade of grass. You look at the one on the right, of course, the grazing, livestock grazing was stopped, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, something like that. And anyhow, you can see that the uh, grasses have, have regrown. But you can see another impact here, and that is the impact of both grazing and fire suppression. If you look at the forest back here, and also on the left side, but especially on the right side, you can see that forest is much more dense today. The one on the right is Hard, harder to see how more dense it is, but it is much more dense. And of course, that is because of the lack of, uh, well, first of all, grazing, allowing uh, tree seedlings to grow because they are not generally not consumed by uh, cattle. And then, uh, of course, fire suppression uh, also enabled that in growth of trees. And then we get at high elevation. This is a view towards the east across the uh, inner basin. So the historical photograph taken in 1910, this was taken by a uh, Forest Service employee, shows a relatively recent ground fire 31 years before uh, the photograph was taken. And you can see it just, most of the valley is, is covered. Some areas of trees remain, and they, of course, show up as dark, some of the dark uh, parts of the uh, photograph. But huge fire. And you can see then after 115 years, 113 years, uh, there is a um, uh, regrowth of that forest. So the, this is mostly spruce fir forest. There's a little bit of mixed conifer in there at the, towards the bottom, some quaking aspen forest in there as well. But the majority of what you see in the photograph on the left is uh, spruce fir forest. Now, spruce fir forest is different from the other forests that we've talked about in that the natural kind of uh, crown fire, natural type of forest fire was crown fire. And the reason for that is, presumably, is because this area gets so much snow and, of course, more rain being at higher, higher elevation, so it's much more moist. And therefore, fires historically were much less common. But when they did burn, there was a lot more fuel for them to burn on. And so the type of fire was not a crown, not a surface fire, excuse me, not a mixed severity fire in general, but a crown fire. And that's uh, what burned in 1879, the last crown fire to have burned in the uh, inner basin. Now, when I make that statement, it automatically brings to my mind how the uh, fires from last summer climbed up the uh, opposite slopes of these structures here and started to uh, reach the peak and then started to uh, raise concerns about them getting down, burning down into, uh, into the inner basin. 
And this was a major concern to the city of Flagstaff because much of our water comes from the, uh, the inner basin. And so the Forest Service therefore decided to uh, uh, fly um, air, uh, fly planes in here to put out the uh, with fire retardants to put out the uh, the fire before it burned down into the uh, inner basin. Because once it would start burning down in there, it would be all, next to impossible to stop, except possibly by by airplanes. So, what is the big picture from this talk? Uh, now that we have visited the San Francisco peaks over a century ago and compare past scenes to the present. One of the big pictures is historical photographs enable understanding the past. Another, repeating historical photographs enables understanding how that past produced the present. Thirdly, understanding both the past and the present enables predicting and preparing for our future. This, along with my love for the San Francisco peaks, is why I did this project. Then just very briefly, some reviewer comments about my, my book. Uh, Kevin Schindler, Historian Lowell Observatory, richly illustrated, positively priceless, engrossing page turn. Pete Filet, forest ecologist at Northern Arizona University, meticulously documented changes in continuities over the century and a half since photography arrived in Northern Arizona. Sean Golightly, who at that time was an environmental reporter for the Daily Sun, reveals a history invisible to the current day residents and offers insights for the construction of our future. And Wally Covington, another forest ecologist uh, retired with uh, Northern Arizona University. Engaging, historically revealing, sets the standard for documenting long-term regional landscape changes. So at the end of my talk, I'd like to conclude it with some thank yous. Julie Hammonds of Solstice uh, Pub Publishing, and that is the publishing company of my, uh, my book. And I thank her for her advice, assistance, and management in preparing the book for publication and in marketing it. Mary Ross of Mary Ross Design, I've already raved about the book cover. Well, she actually laid out to design the entire book. And I thank her for her skill and, and her dedication to this. Tom Alexander of Alexander, Tom Alexander Photography, also based in Flagstaff. And I thank him for his expertise in preparing the photographs, my photographs for publication. Private landowners for permission to search and take photographs on their properties. I probably went up to 30, 30 doors, just knocked on the doors wearing my field outfit, not necessarily clean or anything. Uh, my backpack, jeans that were dirty, maybe even a little bit torn up. And uh, of those 30 people, I think there were two that turned me down. I just was so amazed. It surely reflects upon the people of Flagstaff. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank Betty Huffman, my partner and my wife, for her encouragement, nonstop encouragement, for her advice, her nonstop patience, and for her nonstop love. So the book, again, is published by Solstice here in Flagstaff, and it's available from their website if you're, if you're interested. That then concludes my presentation. And uh, I'm open for, for questions. And if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the question and answer um, portion of your of your webinar, of your Zoom webinar. Um, I had a, a just comment slash question myself, John. Um, sure. Uh, I... I just love looking at the at the contrast, these historic photos. Oh. Um, and, you know, I, I've been in Flagstaff for, tw uh, well, not quite 20 years, 18 years, but I'm rounding up a little bit. But, um, you know, one that, that really kind of got me thinking was that one of downtown taken where you can see Route 66 as well as San Francisco Street. And I know you mentioned that the buildings, um, from the past had burned down several times over. But I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more of your knowledge and maybe other photos, you know, tell us about some other photos you've taken um, of that, of the downtown area and, and kind of what's been happening over the last century um, with the downtown. 
Yes. Uh, one of the things is that I uh, wanted to have this uh, uh, this talk focused on, on ecology. So I only included one of the photographs from downtown just to show you that there were some of those in the, in the book. And there are probably 25, 20, 25 photographs of uh, urban uh, Flagstaff. And these range from Old Town, Old Town being again where the uh, downtown Flags, uh, where Flagstaff began, uh, roughly a mile west of uh, current downtown Flagstaff. Old Town uh, Park is there, Old Town Springs Park is there. So there was a water source there and that's why Old Town began there. And uh, so there are probably uh, three or four uh, photographs, I think four photographs of Old Town. And then a couple of them that are close to Old Town, one of them is one of my, my favorite photographs in the whole book. It's from east of Old Town, which was undeveloped at that time. And it has this gorgeous view across a uh, pond in the foreground with the San Francisco peaks in the background. And I, I won't spoil how the repeat worked out uh, by, uh, by explaining or describing it to you, but it uh, brought a huge smile to my face, the way, the way that it worked out. And then as far as Newtown Flagstaff, there are, uh, oh no, I should go on to Milltown. So Milltown, uh, which became, uh, you know, if you say the word Milltown fairly rapidly, it transitions into Milton. And so those of you who know, obviously most of you do, Milton Road, that was named for Milltown. And Milltown was where a sawmill was built, constructed. And uh, of course, it's long gone. But anyhow, there are probably a half a dozen photographs taken uh, showing the sawmill and areas close by to the sawmill. And then switching over to uh, Newtown, there are, the book has, I would say, uh, seven or eight photographs, well, but probably about five taken actually downtown. And then a few more that are taken very close to downtown that show uh, in a short distance to uh, the buildings at that time, but were undeveloped. And so these repeats of these show homes and other things like that, but they, they do get across the point about the development of the city of Flagstaff. <clears throat> and then there are also a few photographs taken further east, but now in the city of Flagstaff. And uh, one of those is my favorite as well, uh, showing a beautiful forest and uh, uh, Eldon in the, uh, in the photograph as well. But uh, today it's, uh, uh, you can see some of that, but there are also many uh, uh, business signs in, a, in the high, highway and so forth in the, uh, in the photograph. So my favorite photographs as an ecologist, as a plant ecologist, a forest ecologist, my favorite ones are, of course, the ones that are more rural in nature. But I, I, I am entranced by the changes in Flagstaff. And I'll, I'll lay something on you that uh, when you see some of these, if you get the book and look at some of these photographs fairly close to downtown and see what gorgeous views there were of the San Francisco peaks with no buildings at all in the photograph, it made me wonder, well, what if, what if we had established a national park here? And Flagstaff went south of the tracks and not north of, of the tracks, but there was a national park north of the tracks. So I believe there were two national parks at that time uh, when the railroad came through here. One of them was uh, Yellowstone, the first of our national parks. And the other one was Sequoia, Sequoia National Park in California. So it would not have been something new, but... Uh, of course, it, it never came about. Does that help? Yes, and, and it seems like you segued into that another question that you maybe saw in the chat about your favorite photo. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> well, or maybe unintentionally, but you did it anyway. And, and another question is, um, what would you say was the most challenging photo to <laughs> attempt to recreate and why? Well, actually, I one of the most challenging ones, maybe I'm not sure it was the most challenging, but one of the most challenging ones was the one by Red Mountain, where the historical photograph was a little blurry because of its age, of course. And there was a large rock on the left side that I matched up. And there was a cowboy in the historical photograph. And Slate Mountain was there and in the far background, the San Francisco Peaks. I never thought that this was going to happen, but I thought that uh, having that rock there, this would be a relatively easy one to be very precise in repeating this. <laughs> well, 
Well, it took me about seven days to uh, to get a, a repeat of that that I liked and uh, that I thought was was precise. Because I go home and thought, wow, this isn't quite lined up. So I go back out there the next day and reshoot it. Day after day, for seven, seven or eight days, something like that, I had to repeat this one. And I think part of the uh, part of the problem in repeating historical photographs, and this definitely shows up in a couple of the photographs in the book, is that historical cameras were not as precise as the cameras we have today. More specifically, the lens distortion in the historical cameras is much greater than lens distortion in our modern cameras. Now, I had a uh, person tell me, well, what you need to do, John, is that you need to find out what camera, what kind of camera they use for each of these uh, photographs, somehow obtain that, a kind of that kind of camera and reshoot it with that kind of camera. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm already three or four years into the, uh, the, the project. That's going to add 20 years to the project. And uh, <laughs> that, uh, obviously it wasn't for me. The other reason I decided not to is that I wanted to facilitate people in the future repeating these, uh, these photographs, repeating my photographs and showing three different time periods and to have asked them to uh, you know, somehow find these, uh, these uh, cameras and repeat them with those older and older cameras as the decades go by was, was ridiculous. So I decided not to do that. <laughs> and John, I think we have time for one more question that came in. Sure. Uh, it reads, you found historic photos at many sources. Was there a particular source of photos that was a great discovery on new photos for you? Very good question. Um, well, most of the photos were, were new to me, of course. I'd say all but a, but a handful were uh, ones that I'd never seen before. Um, well, maybe 20 of them I had seen before. So the other ones, 100 other photographs. I was, I was certainly inspired by some uh, that were so gorgeous, so beautiful. And to think that they had been taken up 100 and plus years ago uh, with a camera back then just astounded me. And I'd say one of those was uh, the historical photograph, the half of the historical photograph that is on the cover to the book, as you, you maybe still be able to see here. So the black and white photograph to the left with the uh, wagon in the horse, horse wagon, horse-drawn wagon. I just, I just love that photograph because of the famous photographer and uh, artists that are sitting there or standing there. And then the, uh, the beautiful peaks in the background. Uh, that just that just is so meaningful me for me to say this is history. Any other questions? Absolutely, that's so fantastic. Well, I think that uh, everyone who's still on the call, which is really everyone, um, would like to thank you, John, for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, and and so visually stimulating, you know, it's it's really a lot of fun to be able to see your process and see the historic photo and the new photo. Um, and so we just want to thank you from the Festival of Science. And um, I'd like to remind everyone to please fill out the survey when they have the chance. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you. I'm sure um, very appreciative of all the people who attended. Thank you very much.